thank you very much for the invitation that I can take part in this forum. It is my job to introduce the next panel, which deals with inequality and dimensions of inequality, which we hardly look at at other times. The two presentations have been an ideal introduction to this panel, so I think uh, I had to change my remarks, which I did. I shortened them. I would like to address two issues which were addressed in the two presentations, and which I find fascinating, and I believe that the panel should discuss them and maybe answer all the questions which I cannot answer now. I would like to start with the difference which I found fascinating in the second presentation of Mrs. Jayaraman between equal quality and justice, equal wages, equal prosperity and equal opportunities. I find it fascinating how we economists are dealing with that. And this is what I did before that. You know, I think it was the right time to do that. I looked at economists, our classical economists, how they dealt with these issues of inequalities in a society. And I believe one example which supports this thesis, and there's one which less supports this thesis. The first example, and this is what economists always are about Adam Smith, 18th century, a wonderful passage. Is it all right to levy higher taxes on luxury goods or shall we levy heavier or higher taxes on essential goods? And he said essential goods. So you may say, well, he had on his mind that these are poor people and they do not buy luxury goods and they wanted to relieve their burden. And he said, well, if I levy taxes on essentials, then the following problem will occur. People driving growth, and at the time these were factory owners, those having an enterprise, they pay minimum wages, that is the wage which is absolutely necessary in order to survive. If you levy taxes on essentials, then you have to raise wages, because if you do not raise wages, then the workers will not have a minimum wage for their subsistence. And therefore the burden of levying taxes on essentials is you know, placed on the shoulders of the workers. So this is a heartless perspective, but maybe it fits you know, being food for thought that thinking about inequality was not in the focus of deliberations. But there's another one who is also as important, Alfred Marshall, an empiricist of the 19th century. And he was very much interested in the fate of poor people. People say that uh, he had a photo of a worker family above his desk and in contrast to many colleagues he went to many factories he wanted to know what's going on there so he also went to workers districts and thought how they live so he was v very well acquainted with that and in bristol he gave a series of lectures three lectures about progress and poverty and he said among other things that we should not be happy with our progress as long as there's so much suffering in this world. Is this about justice? I don't know. But I think it is much closer to the perspective asking the question who has a share, who participates, and in these times with lots of productivity increases, who's got a share, who participates in all this? I believe that this is a dimension which gets closer to this idea of justice. And then in the first uh, presentation by Mr. Wolf that justice in economics must be equated to equal opportunities. It may have to do with that. And then there were some objections. The theory of equal opportunities, that is, that we have to level out uh, opportunities. And there's another objection which I think is also important. It is like this. Let us imagine we have equal opportunities for everyone. 
let's assume people because they do not work hard they are at the bottom of the society they suffer so the theory the theory of equal opportunities would say this is just because they are to be blamed for that themselves so a society with equal opportunities and some are starving so this might be called a just society probably not but we have to add to this at least add the demand that people who are to be blamed for themselves for their po poverty are to be given assistance so that they can reach a minimum say livelihood this means the theory of equal opportunities is not a convincing justice or equality theory or at least it is not sufficient but this brings me to the last point I'd like to address today in this panel this is a point which Mr. Wolf mentioned and this is a fascinating implication which brings it is the question what happens when people develop children develop grow up is life a tournament that is if one is doing well then the others are doing poorly so is that how we prepare our children to you know push away others in order to be successful but you can do that by being very good or by learning to trip up someone or push away someone so the economists say that pushing away someone is not a not a productive idea in terms of the whole society so growing is more important so that the pie like economists say becomes greater we want to have people who are not better or worse than others but we want to have people who develop who make a contribution to the society to the prosperity of the society but now we face the following problem the way we measure justice or distribution of wages how we measure it here we focused on the concept of relative equality look at politics for instance questions how do you measure poverty some people say the poverty rate has increased then this does not refer to people who do not have enough to eat but it refers to relative poverty 40 percent of the median every uh, wage so others say 60 percent of the median wage this is the poverty threshold so this is a relative term and the entire discussion we've just saw seen it one percent of the population you know own sixty percent of the wealth of the society these are relative poverty measures and this means we move into a world where questions of distributions turn into questions of conflicts if you measure wealth or poverty in relative terms then cannot then not everyone can benefit someone will be higher up and others will be lower in this hierarchy and we frame things like equal opportunities or the economic uh, happenings or the distribution we then start thinking which means that we have a kind of a zero sum game what one is winning is the another is losing and this has become clear to me while listening to the presentation that this is a problem and certainly there are good reasons why we measure wealth and poverty in relative terms it's not really convincing but you know you know you are doing much better than people in Congo if you tell that to poor people here but I think this also indicates that we have to take this into a mind if we want to understand what justice or equal opportunities equal wages means so this is uh, a kind of uh, headline how we measure things and you know to answer these questions poverty for instance how 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 it is measured so relative measurement of wages should you get rid of it shall we ask other questions climate politics shall we take into account how emissions of the past influence today's situation shall we pay to developing countries as uh, you know compensation for things that happened in the past questions and questions and i'm really looking forward to the panel answering all these questions and this brings me to the panel i'd like to ask the host
Wolfgang Schön is the director of the Max Planck Institute uh, for Finances and Tax Issues. Welcome. Before everyone is here, I would like to say a few words about this panel. It is a big tradition of the Convoco forums that we get together for these panel discussions. And the reason is that we've been working for two, two weeks already. Mrs. Flick always invites a fixed and also expanding circle of scientists, entrepreneurs, diplomats, people from politics to have a two-day closed working session and discuss and prepare the fundamental questions which we are going to talk about here and also bring the momentum from the discussions to this discussion. So we're going to do two things. Like Mr. First said, we're going to answer all questions which surfaced during the previous presentations, but we will also talk about deliberations which we discussed in our forum in turn. We have four panelists. I'm sure that those who visit the forum frequently know three faces. Professor Peter Michael Huber, professor at the Munich University and a judge of the Federal Constitutional Court with a busy week after him. It was an oral uh, hearing about the coronavirus measures of the federal government and the EU. And uh, if you read his portrait in the FSZ, he, there was an apt description of a fight for democracy. And if you know this, then you tally it very well with what you hear when he was talking at these panels. Then Professor Rochel, President of the European School of Management and Technology in Berlin, and he knows about financial research very well in the broadest sense of the word. To my left, Karl Kai Konrad, he's a director at the Max Planck Institute for Tax Law and Public Finance, but he knows much more. Economics of governments is probably best describing the whole gamut of his activities. And I'm very happy to welcome Professor Marietta Auer. She's here for the first time. She also found her way to the Max Planck Institute. She's a director there for legal history and legal theory. And for a few weeks, he's now become the vice president of the German Research Association. And I'm very happy about that. Welcome to everyone. But we heard a lot about equality also in the context, in this context, justice, equal opportunities. But the word which hardly ever surfaced, although it has been mentioned uh, in the context of equality since the French Revolution, is freedom, liberty, the possibility to distinguish, to differentiate yourself and to have a choice. So this is a constitutional right and I would like to start with Professor Michael Huber. Where in this context is from the perspective of the constitutional right, can you find the concept of freedom or liberty? Well, I listened to the fascinating presentations and thought about what this could mean as a legal consequence. And I had the impression that implementing all of this, even in a society without different classes would be overtaxing the legal system, as we heard from Mr. Fink this morning. Now, the basic law, European treaties, the legal system, this is something that, cannot, that they cannot produce, and it cannot be the primary goal. Of course, the primary r role of the legal order or the rule of law is to abide by all of their requirements. And when we talk about material justice, but justice is not an operational legal term which you can use to enact laws or to come up with court judgments. One thing is clear. Clemens Wuss talked about this system as not being a tournament. What we need is a level playing field in the legal sense of the term. And the starting point for all of this was mentioned by Ms. Flick in her introduction. European and legal systems are an Archimedean point. And 
only a few core guarantees are included there. These include equal freedom, legal equality, and the ability to be able to forge your own destiny. If I heard things correctly, Ms. Flick referred to Pico della Mirandola and that everyone should be able to forge his own destiny. That is the starting point. Here we all have legal equality in society. In other words, we have the same rights, but we don't have the same possibilities, nor do we all have use distributiva, which would guarantee this. In other words, it assumes that we have freedom. If you are forging your own destiny by choosing a profession, getting married, having children, and guaranteeing our basic rights, these are possibilities for freedom, which we all have, and that means, obviously, Inevitably, inevitably, even though we are different, we have different talents, we are willing to achieve more or less, perform more or less. So this leads to inequality. So inequality is the necessary consequence of freedom. Now, this is where the state comes into play. The state has to think about the question of guaranteeing quality, banning discrimination, and the question of the social state. How much lack of equality, how much inequality can I afford? Are these ideas on justice? Is the majority willing to accept this? And that is the democratic process. In other words, this is a typical justification of the restrictions of our freedoms. I think three points here are important here and are related to this basic assumption. You cannot be a group when you're talking about forging your own destiny. Each and every one of us decides individually what ideas we have and what makes for a happy life and how we can achieve a happy life. In other words, media coverage by social groups, minorities, interest groups, and things like that, this can be integrated into our system, but not at the root of it. And it must not say or negate the fact that self-determination is the benchmark upon which all of this must be measured. The second point, historical inequality, problems in distribution, colonialism, and this is something which plays a role in political conflicts. In other words, we talk about defining equality. But for people who are living today, for our children, it cannot be relevant if we consider, about, consider their rights. We cannot consider whether they're grandparents or parents, or if we used up too many resources, there's no collectivization. They have the same rights as we do. Not No fewer rights than people in Nigeria, India, or China. Now a third point, right, the third point is well, it has to be a question of coming up with a reasonable balance, striking a balance between political requirements for equality and self-determination. In other words, when we talk about freedom, this is also something which allows for a lot of compromises due to the idea of proportionality, proportionality. And also with regard to climate protection, that was the revolutionary idea in the first Senate when talking about freedom. We said it, it's not possible for all of the emission rights to have been used up by 2030 and then the future generates, generations, or at least then let's say in two year, 20 years time, they will not have anything else. We'll have to come to climate neutrality. So to strike a balance here is a question of proportionality, of restriction of freedoms, and this is something 
which can be seen together and cannot be achieved with the rougher grid here. Thank you. So uh, this is a concept of the constitutional law which says Roughly speaking, the state has to provide for equality. Equality vis-à-vis -vis the law is found in the basic law and the individual can live his or her own life within, as long as it is within this framework. But we also see an increase of obligations of the individual ban of discrimination of all kinds. And this is what you find in private law as well. Now is this, and I ask the economists, but also Mrs. Auer, which is our right or do you think we should stay with a classical liberal order? Should we do this? Is it okay or not? These are normative questions which society is negotiating again and again. And it does indeed happen. I agree with your observation. We have become more aware of violations of equality within society amongst private individuals. Equality is not only a question which is addressed to the state as a rough grid. No, it is a question which is being discussed within society. How far does this go? To what extent can we manage to ask such questions? That's a totally different question. And these are questions that are being asked again and again and are changing. From economics, I know that the Nobel laureate uh, Gary Becker said, you should have a taste for discrimination. So you might like discrimination. This is also a preference which you are allowed to live out, meaning you go to Greek restaurants only, not Italian restaurants. Now, is this still state of the affairs? Would you use this argument, Mr. Konrad Rochol? Now, this taste for discrimination, is it still a basic assumption of forming your preferences? Well, this is based on the theory that an entrepreneur who discriminates based on the color of someone's skin will no longer get the best people based on the salary that he pays. In other words, for the same money, he could hire people who would make a bigger contribution to profit. But if he practices discrimination and can afford to do so, well, okay. In a society with competition, where c companies are in tough competition with one another, then, of course, this entrepreneur will either have to make additional contributions or will have to close down shop. That was Becker's argument, and I think that this is timeless. It's correct. And, of course, dis we discriminate all the time, not between people, but between products. We select the products that we want, and this is an area where this discussion really hasn't even gotten started yet. But I don't think that's really the background to your question. Yes, it is. A free choice of products, I believe it is not attacked anywhere. But using choice of products, differentiating between manufacturers meaning the possibilities of the manufacturers are also limited using diverse teams or homogeneous teams, all this. I think the fundamental freedom of the consumers is so kind of spreading through all upstream economic decisions. So this is the case, isn't it? That's hard to say. It's interesting to see that we are distinguishing between the corporate world and the private world. Such a radical distinction is being made. Nobody would have thought about considering us the selection of our partner, our spouse, for instance, to consider this under the aspect of a ban on discrimination. If you want to, or if you meet someone, you go to the disco, and, well, that's the way things were done 30 years ago. Things are done differently today, of course, I know. But let's say every put a but he put a paper bag over their head and you couldn't talk to these people because otherwise from their voice you could learn something about the individual. So this is something where this ban on discrimination is something that has not really yet penetrated the situation. But in the corporate world, it is there in full. And this would be a specific obligation with regard to public the public sphere. I think that makes good sense in the corporate world, and this comes back to Gary Becker. Why is a company, well, a company is not only a profit-oriented uh, 
company. It belongs to a different sphere. The company, and I'm sure there is some family-owned businesses present here today, and they know that in the company, with the company, and with the employees in the company, you live with them. And this is the family-oriented as aspect, and that's something that we certainly cannot neglect. So today, when you select your most important employees, this is where you can see a strict ban on discrimination. Well, I think this is a different situation. It's something we hadn't really thought about up until now, but that's my direct answer to your question. I understand. Yes, Jörg, please. I would like to pick up on that because Becca contrasted taste-based and statistics-based discrimination. And I thought about how I could give you a nice example. Let's assume that I'm the owner of a basketball team in the United States. Then I would probably say that if I need somebody under the basket, I would be better off with someone who's six feet tall as opposed to someone who's five foot two, because statistically speaking, someone who's six feet tall, all other things being equal, would be in a better position to get a basket or to prevent somebody else from getting the ball in the basket than someone who is five foot two. This is statistics-based discrimination, which is perfectly okay. Now, if I'm talking about these two people who, if I've got two people who are six feet tall, one is black and one is white, and if I say, the only reason why I don't select the one who is black, because that's my taste, that's exactly what would happen, exactly as Kai Conrad described. Then all of a sudden, on the basis of my taste, and I'm willing to accept losses as a result of this, but then I would have a poor result. And that is what would happen. And then you have to ask the following question. What can I say statistically in terms of discrimination? If I'm data-driven, that's what we heard before. If I'm data-driven, what can I understand in terms of being better or worse? And what is absolutely disgraceful because it's only due to my wrong taste or my wrong preference. Next item, another catchword which Mr. Wolf, as well as Mr. Fust, the tournament. Is life a tournament? Can we imagine a society without competition? Or aren't there goods, products, positions, opinions in companies, in political hierarchies, which make it mandatory that there are tournaments, winners, losers, Karl Conrad, uh, the economics of governance. Is it possible to have a society without tournaments? I have followed these presentations. They were fascinating. I'd like to mention that, by the way, And I must say, I learned a lot, and the idea of a tournament was clear in both presentations. It reminded me of a book I read a long time ago by Fred Hirsch, The Limits to Growth. This is something that I would reinterpret and say it's structural. Well, I'd give it a different title, Structural Limits to Ex Post or Equal Outcome. This is a simple example. I would never train someone to become a pilot who's blind. It would not be a good idea as long as the technology behind flying is the way it is today. And that's why Fred Hirsch would say in society, and this applies to all forms of society, autocracies and democracies, earlier societies, later societies, typically we have a development of hierarchies and division of labor. Hierarchy is maybe less important than the division of labor. Now, if people are different because of their different skills, then the right woman will be available for the right position in our society. But unfortunately, we don't know that beforehand, and that's why they have to enter into a competition. And then The trend is that the best candidate, the most appropriate candidate, will be selected if the selection process is the right one. That's a different question, obviously. It's not always the case when it comes to selection processes. But basically, it means that we are living in a world where everybody can enter the tournament. Otherwise, we have unequal results. In Germany, we'll only have one chancellor, and 
in the we used to have 30 DAX companies in Germany, then there would be 30 CEOs in the DAX companies and not 80 million. So this is a type of ex post inequality. And this is something that is related to the system and productive organization in our society. These are clearly related. You can do things somewhat differently. You can do the change the principle somewhat. But you will have the situation where ex post you will have winners and losers and it makes no sense to distinguish between the winners and losers and to put them all on a le equal footing i think it's not just enough to talk about money if you pay everyone the same salary you can't pay the challenger the average income but we're still faced with the dilemma people will enter the terminant and then we will come up with one chancellor there are other things that would play a role as well. Mr. Wolf made this very clear, and Fred Hirsch as well. He were talking about status primarily. It's not so much a question of the income, it's a question of status. And this is associated with this position. And that is basically a question here of not living primarily for money. Money is often just instrumental. Some people buy a fantastic sports car, and this has an instrumental character. The money itself is insignificant. Status is not insignificant. And this is something that can be instrumental as well, but it's there to satisfy our psychological needs. So I don't think that there will be societies which will have ex post equality simply because we have this form of organization where people are selected for the right position. So if I use Mr. Wolf's example, there will not be a society in which we will all be awarded the seahorse swim badge only in pools. You will always race in competitions. Now for these tournaments, Mr. Michael Huber, does law say anything? Is there an equality requirement when it comes to fighting for a CEO post, the federal chancellery, or for a high court judge post? I would say that the starting point is that it's not a tournament. It's a question of developing freedom. And as long as there is no shortage, then everyone can interpret their freedom as allowed by law. But again and again, when developing our freedom, there are certain problems of shortages. There is only one chancellor, and there are theoretically 598 members of parliament in Germany and 751 members of the European Parliament. If you want to be one of these members, you have to compete with the other candidates. Our law has organized free, general, secret elections, and then the candidates have to compete for the voters appeal and the one who is the most convincing or whose party is convincing most convincing wins in public service section 33 of our basic law calls for the principle of merit and performance we have a lot of public servants but not all 83 million inhabitants are public servants to become a professor at a university or the director of a Max Planck Institute will only be possible if you have the necessary aptitude and skills. Here there is competition. Now when we talk about competing for customers as an entrepreneur, the law requires that you must not abuse a dominating position, there must be no collusion, you must not be subsidized, all sorts of requirements and rules to the tournament. And here our legal system tries to make sure that you can have good competition. But as I said, whenever it is not a question of a problem of shortages or scarcities, we can do whatever we like. I think as a private law expert, Mrs. Auer, I believe you like to hear that, I assume.
but I would like to ask you for two things. Please comment on this first, but then move on to another issue which was addressed not only in our discussions over the last few days, but also in the presentations of Mr. Wolf and the subsequent presentation by Jari. Equality in the fields of environmental policy, climate policy, of collective renunciation or collective sacrifice, an equality which threatens a lot of limitations and constraints. Maybe you could comment that in more detail. Thank you. I'd be happy to. I think this is lovely to talk about law and the world, that we have all sorts of possibilities until we have shortages. But the truth is, our world is characterized by all sorts of shortages which are responsible for the existence of economists, and that's why we're all here today. I'll talk to you a question in just a minute, but I'd first like to turn back to climate justice. We've heard something about that already. Before I do so, however, I'd like to pick up on the question raised by Mr. Fust. In other words, the problem of equality has become a problem of justice. And I think we've heard some interesting things on this in the first presentation today. Equality is only a relationship between numbers. There's always a comparison. It's a relative question of equality. Comparison between two people, two groups, two continents, two countries, two regions. These are always two points with regard to a specific category. Problems of justice result when it turns into a social problem, when living conditions are affected. And that's what we heard earlier on. That was very interesting when we talk about justice of distribution and social equality. Now, when it comes to the question as to shortages in the world when it comes to the climate, two minor points. This climate problem is not only a problem of equality or inequality, it's also a problem of justice. And it becomes a just justice problem because it is a social problem. We are living in a world of climatic shortages. I'm sure you've all read it in the press yesterday. The day before yesterday was Earth Overshoot Day, the 28th of July, earlier than ever before. That's the day when the resources of this planet can be renewed, have already been consumed. In other words, if we continue to live as we have been living this year, we will need 1.75 Earths, but we only have one Earth. This is an Earth characterized by shortages. But this is only the global average for all countries and all inhabitants. If you look at every country separately, then you will see that figures are quite different. If everyone were to live as the Americans live, then we would need five Earths in order to make up for the resources that have been consumed. Now, what is a social problem about all of this? We just heard that the global climate change will force restrictions on us, and these will impact different people and different countries in different ways. Now, if you take the countries of the West, for example, Europe and the United States, if they say, okay, we realize we are responsible for the largest share of CO2 emissions, so we have to reduce our emissions more, then this will cause internal problems socially because there are different groups of people and they are impacted differently. To be more specific, in the United States you can see we have white groups of voters in the Midwest that will be heavily impacted and this can lead to extreme reactions. That's one social problem. But if on the other hand you consider the necessity to reduce our and conserve our consumption, then you can say that these will also be affected world populations in different ways. The effects of climate change will affect countries close to the equator much more than they affect us, even though we can see them very clearly here as well, but near the equator they're affected even more. There are social problems there as well. These are not just problems saying that the temperature is going up or that water is trickling away and that areas are becoming deserts and can no longer be inhabited. These are problems that are related to migration and the impossibility 
to earn a living and the impossibility to be educated and other consequences which will be related to gender equality in certain countries and will also be related to equal educational opportunities, also demographic equality and questions of life expectancy. So once again, these are clearly social problems. And this is where questions of equality become questions of justice. How they can be solved is something that cannot simply be lumped together. Again, this is something which depends on the respective situation. Now, these problems must be addressed. That is a task that lies before all of us. And this is something that all of our disciplines will have to solve together. Thank you. And now I look at uh, Jörg Rochol. For many decades now, the economists have come up with many instruments to handle climate problems, quantity control, price control, bans, and another area which is of great interest to you and which has gained momentum over the last few years, sustainable finance. Clear statements have been made by the UN, OECD and EU that several hundreds of billions of euros should be invested in green areas in order to tackle this issue at least to some extent and this at the expense of consumption and alternative investment of social benefits etc. Do economists have an answer to this question, how this great transformation, as it is called sometimes, can be cushioned, taking into account equality issues? That is indeed a very large growth area. A lot of investors want to invest in a green way. And this is something that will primarily lead to the fact that we will have losses at different places. Some losses that have just been described to us by Ms. Awa, certain regions will be much more impacted than others. Anything near the equator, for instance, will be impacted more than other areas. And the same applies to investments that companies now have, but that are not worth anything anymore. Apart from the current crisis, think about coal-fired power plants. They will have to be written off at some point in time, and this will mean that the capital stock that was there before is not worth as much as it was before. It will have to be replaced by something else, and other things will become more valuable. So the question that results from all of this is, to what extent is state compensation necessary? Let me try to come up with a sort of outline as to what a criterion could look like. We have this worldwide, but we also have floods on a national level. And here we can see the floods and to what extent should the state be responsible for compensating people for this. We know that due to climate change, certain regions in the world can no longer be settled or not as inhabitable as they were before because the risk of settling there, if you settle there, property will be lost. The risk of losing property is much higher. And economists, Kidland and Prescott, in Rules of Discretion, have given us some very clear ideas out of how this might work or might not work. Let's begin by, if you have a flood, if you reimburse everyone, then this is sending out an implicit message that such reimbursements will be made in the future as well. Even if I've seen a flood and if I settle there again, I can expect a flood there again. So if reimbursements are made, then they should be made where, let's say for example, on the equator, they can't really help the fact that they're in the situation. They settled there 50 years ago, so it would be more justified to reimburse them than in an area in the river valley where you can expect a flood every five years. Yes, and here I turn to Mr. Huber. You said the first Senate made, in the full sense of the word, a predictive judgment in the context of the consequences of climate change asked today's generation not to consume things at the expense of future generations and push them into excessive thriftiness or into a loss of prosperity.
but this issue goes far beyond that. I heard a skepticism related to the historical responsibility as a point of deliberation, but I also heard skepticism related to the global side of the obligation. That is, how national states can, must, are allowed to run environmental policy, to what extent can they do what uh, Raji showed, forward-looking is okay, backward-looking is not so good. Are there any trends? I do believe that climate change cannot be solved on a national level. 2% is, I believe, the amount of CO2 emissions from Germany. So we need an international agreement. We have the Paris Agreement, and everyone has committed to the 1.5 degree goal wherever possible, and a number of different pillars regarding CO2 emissions globally. Everyone has to make a contribution within their possibilities and responsibilities. And Germany, with 2%, will also have to achieve this goal. In other words, we will have to become climate neutral by 2045, which is now in the Climate Protection Act. This is the goal. This is in order for us to achieve this goal. Now, we've heard this argument already. 2%, you're not going to solve the climate problem. But we have to do whatever we can. We have to do whatever is achievable and realistic. 2%, this is not going to stop climate change, but it's no excuse to do nothing. I think that's obvious to all of us. Now, the question of historic responsibility, this is a question which needs to be negotiated in a political process, such as colonial legacy, etc. It needs to be negotiated politically, but it will not necessarily lead to direct measures from the Constitution or agreements. This is all something which is innovative in our Climate Protection Act. It's not only a question of assessing things today as to their feasibility and consistency. As I said, not half of this can be achieved in the last 20 years. And in Germany, people after 2030 are also going to want to go to work, to drive, go for a walk, have children, etc. And against this backdrop, I don't think that there is any magic plan. We will need hundreds of levers on an international European national, corporate level, in every authority and institution. Everyone needs to make a contribution in order to achieve these goals. Thank you very much. There's a last issue, and I would like to discuss it with Jörg Rochol. Reading Tocqueville about democracy in America, he writes, if all other equalities have fallen away, origin, nobility, nationality, then inequality of ownership stands out and it becomes the target of inequality debates. Now the question arises, what can you do in order to handle inequalities in this field, and these exist in Germany too, and which are mentioned in statistics, and Raji also gave us a world statistics, is this an issue which you could handle or tackle with new methods? In my opinion, that is clearly to be answered in the affirmative. This applies to Germany and Austria. In both countries, the savings rate is very high, higher than any other country in the EU or even in the OECD. But at the same time, financial assets per capita are somewhere in the middle. In other words, we are faced with a situation where it seems that the savings process does not correlate with an increase in wealth. And this is something that definitely needs to be tackled. And if you take a look at the current situation, 
The following situation results. A savings bank president was quoted who said that up until now, 40% of the customers were not able to save a single euro at the end of the month. And with inflation, this figure goes up to 50% or even more. And inflation has shown that despite all of the reservations there may be, with regard to higher risk investments, such as investments in shares, real estate, or others, this is a situation which shows how important it is to invest in these type of investments. And that's why, not only for an economic point of view, I also believe that we need to consider these different aspects. A whole slew of measures that could be considered, for example, profit sharing for employees and companies, or a pension as we have in the Swedish system, or perhaps relief when acquiring your first home. And I'm sure a number of other aspects could be considered as well to focus on acquiring property. That's a very interesting point in the Constitution for the city of Berlin. They have stated that this does not lead to building more apartments. It also leads to questions as to how more expropriation is possible. Thank you. Before we have our Q&A, briefly call Conrad about this issue, please. Now, when it comes to inequality in terms of wealth, because this played a very important role in the presentation, and I'd like to turn to the age dimension, and this is important when evaluating the distribution of wealth in society. All of us are born, let me put this provocatively, as rich as we will never be, but the bank, our bank account has a zero balance. The cash value of everything that we earn over the course of our lives, net investments, all of it is already there. And from there, we consume and we become poorer and poorer. Nonetheless, you can see this in the distribution of assets. It's not reflected there. On the contrary, for a while, you don't save anything, then you have your children, you don't save anything, then they leave home, and then you begin to save for old age. Then you're 60 or maybe even 70, and then you've reached your peak. So you have identical populations. All are born equal. They all have the same job, the same consumption preferences. You have a total degree of inequality. And this is something, and I was quite shocked when Mr. Rochel said 40% cannot save anything. Well, maybe those are the people who are not in the phase of saving. So that is certainly not a problem. It would be no problem whatsoever. But I think that if you consider the distribution of wealth, as we heard in the presentation, then it would be very important to make it very clear why old people are rich and why the poor people, when it comes to assets are poor and that this is certainly nothing to do has nothing to do with unjust distribution because everyone was young at one point in time if you ask me personally would I like to switch with someone who's young without any assets I said yes of course obviously right away that just shows us that this individual is not in a less good position than I am myself well an employee of a company, 65 years old, once told me the idea of no longer being able to live off one's own human capital when entering retirement was a huge burden to him. Because from then on you consume what you've saved up, maybe pensions or whatever. 